Hello. Hi. How are we all doing today? Good. Okay. Looks like a few people are uh, just starting to join us. We'll get started in just a moment, please. do a quick sound check. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Okay, I think we're about ready to go ahead and get started. Um, hi everyone, my name is Shane Severson, Director of Communications for Utah Prisoner Advocate Network. I wanna thank you for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules to join us today. Um, I know uh, in, in the midst of all the craziness, uh, sometimes it's it's good of us to still try to keep the UPAN uh, flow going. Um, I know it's been kind of difficult since we haven't been able to uh, meet in person, um, but hopefully the new Zoom format will allow us to stay connected. Um, with that, I think it looks like we've got Wendy Parmley on. I want to welcome and introduce mm -hmm. Wendy Parmley. She's uh, a recent new uh, appointee as director over medical issues for Utah Prisoner Advocate. So, and we're so excited to have her on. So, and she's going to actually kind of lead the charge tonight. So, uh, Wendy, if you're there, you want to. Sure. Thanks, Shane, for the introduction and welcome everyone. It looks like we've got quite a few more folks on tonight than we had last month. So, that is great. Um, Today, as we advertise, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID, but we're also excited for a couple of um, presenters. Um, we have with us Angela, I've got a, or Angelo um, Sandoval, who is uh, a recent, um, somebody who was recently released from Wasatch, um, who will share his experience. And then also his mother uh, talking about um, um, uh, trying to find housing, that's uh, problematic. And, and so t um, following up uh, on that, we will also be pleased to hear from Matt Holman, who was formerly incarcerated. And um, he is a justice reform advocate and he cares deeply about the transformative power of education and issues facing people transitioning back into the world. And that's where uh, Angela is at right now is that transition period. So I wanted to give him an opportunity to talk first about his experience and in particular as we're addressing some of those COVID issues that has been in the news and we've all been anxious about um, to share some of uh, of what his observations were so that we can maybe ease some folks' minds, but also let's talk, um, we'll have an opportunity to spend maybe 15, 20 minutes if there are concerns from those of you who are, are participating and and um, so we can hear those and address some of those and, and give you an update as to where we're at 
Um, uh, the Department of Corrections did update their site today um, with current numbers. And I, I know there's a lot of anxiety out there, but want to assure you that everything is being done um, that is possible to, to keep our loved ones safe. So with that, let's turn the time over to Angelo. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Angelo. Uh, I was just released about a week ago. Uh, as far as the COVID goes, uh, so I was over on A-West in Wasatch with, I don't know, a bunch of other guys. Um, and a lot of the time over there, a lot of people say that it's it's a warlike zone. It, it really isn't. Uh, everybody's having fun. They're joking around. They're clowning on each other. Uh, the guards try to stay out of the section as much as possible and have very little contact with, with the inmates. Uh, as far as rec time goes, there is only 20 minutes every other day because there's four tiers with about 25 people on a tier and they're letting only one person out for 20 minutes, but and they go as late as one o'clock in the morning on letting people out. I remember the night before I got out, people were out running around 12, 12, 20, 12, 40, one o'clock in the morning. Um, and then as far as like the kitchen goes with the food, there are no inmates in the kitchen. There's only the guards are in there. Uh, the food is relatively warm when it gets back to the section, it's not, it's not hot, but it's not cold, if that makes sense. So that's just, that was my experience in there. Um, they took away the gym, the yards are shut down as well. So it, you're, you're confined to just your, your section. So you can shower and use the phone if you have enough time. Thank you, Angelo. Um, I do want to let folks know that we um, we do have Fox uh, 13 with us to tonight, and we're happy for that. But they are they are recording, um, and uh, not sure what that report will be. But uh, did want to welcome them to our our forum, and this is a new format for us. Uh, we. Uh, uh, did meet um, virtually last month, but uh, we weren't able to see the participants. So today we're on Zoom instead of the web uh, web meeting, and um, it's kind of nice to be able to see each other and to be able to connect that way. Um, but I'd like to um, follow up on what Angelo uh, talked about and um, and take any questions or any concerns that folks might have. But first, let me give let me give a brief update. So. Um, as, as you're aware, uh, the COVID um, outbreak began about three weeks ago, towards the end of September. And on October 7th, last week, there were 219 folks who had tested positive in Draper with one in Gunnison and 40 in the county jails and 11 in the CCCs, the, the Community Correctional Centers. And uh, this information is updated on the Department of Corrections website a couple of times a week. So that was um, five days ago, and today they've had an additional uh, 60 cases reported in Draper, and Gunnison still remains at one, and the county jail's at 40. Now, uh, there are 14 that they're reporting as recovered. Most of those who are, um, all, all of those who are positive at Draper are in the Wasatch a and um, units and um, 61 staff have also been affected and uh, 28 of those have recovered. So you, you're, a, you're um, able to go on the Utah Department of Correction website and get this information. They've also recently updated um, with an FAQ. So uh, as we talk, there, there may be answers that are, that are on that FAQ sheet. Um, again, that was just released um, last week on the 5th, but um, I know there's really heightened anxiety when we're not able to hear from our loved ones, and I know that that um, makes us even more afraid, but really most of the cases are, are mild. They have hospitalized, if, or excuse me, today there was one more hospitalization that they re reported. Um, so you can find the actual uh, uh, hospitalization rates 
at the um, coronavirus.utah.gov website. And those numbers don't exactly match the uh, Department of Corrections website. Um, the coronavirus.utah.gov website is actually reporting 526 cases um, last or yesterday and today 538. So an increase of 12 cases from yesterday have been reported um, uh, of incarcerated folks have been reported positive with eight outbreaks across the state, um, including in our, uh, in our county jails, um, as well as Draper and Gunnison. And uh, now 16 hospitalizations from those. So we may see more hospitalizations, but it seems that um, for the most part, those are being able to be managed in the facilities with increased checks and, um, and they're all being housed in the Wasatch uh, units, A and B. So with that, I'll open it up um, to questions for about 15 minutes if, if we need that long, and then we'll move on to, um, to uh, Carol, uh, who will be our next uh, presenter. So any questions? I think there's a raise your hand, maybe not, um, or chat. You can use the chat setting if you've got a question and we can address those. Um, it should be able to unmute yeah. themselves, I believe. Yeah, so you can unmute yourself. I'll throw in a comment, Wendy. This is Faye. Okay, great. Um, my husband's over in Promontory, and over there, there are no cases. Um, they've been on, we call it soft resolve for the last couple of weeks, where they're still doing their ther therapeutic community lifestyle but they have all their rules they have to follow and their strict schedules, but it's, it's eased up a little bit so they don't have to get up as early or go to bed, and, you know, or just, it's just not as, as strict, but they're pretty much keeping with their own dorms. So there's 50 people in a dorm. And so um, they can go out to the yard for an hour a day, but there's, there's no intermingling between dorms. So they're really trying to keep that down. They haven't had programming since the COVID shutdown. But as of this week, they are getting the counselors back in to continue their treatment programs. So things are opening up on that part of the prison, which is good news. Um, so yeah, and I, it seems like what I've heard is just being contained pretty well to the Wasatch area. But I'm only familiar with Promontory, so there may be other stories from people who have loved ones in other parts of the prison that they can share how it is for them. Thanks, Faye. Any other, any other comments or feedback? Hi, I'm Maureen and my last name is Parker. Um, this is the, I've been on your newsletter, but I haven't um, joined your Zoom meetings. And I have a son who is in Draper and he was infected with COVID three weeks ago. Um, he, was, he was quite ill. Um, you know, the usual symptoms, shortness of breath, fever, achy all over, et cetera. And um, according to his sister, who I spoke with this evening, she said that um, he's been retested for COVID. Um, and I, I guess that would have been over the weekend or at the end of last week. And he remains positive. Um, the unfortunate piece is that he had been in general population and um, was waiting to get out and was with the group that, you know, they were letting them out early, you know, because of these infections. One thing that um, I have not heard directly from him, but I did hear from his girlfriend, is that um, they have days where they're only getting one meal um, because the, um, the supposedly the people who, um, are supposed to be, you know, giving them food and such. A lot of them were afraid to come in. Um, so I, you know, and I did see that on Facebook from somebody else's um, son as well. I, you know, again, it's hearsay. I don't know the facts, but that's what I've heard. And obviously, you know, it's a huge human rights violation, you know, as well as not protecting, you know, um, these people. Thank you, Maureen. Or tell me your name again. It's Maureen Parker. Oh, Maureen. Okay, yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anybody else have those same concerns, especially you know, with the one meal uh, a day? That's that doesn't seem right. You're right. Uh, 
have you may, um, I, may I ask you one more question sure um, I guess you know I've of course I've you know follow I don't live in Nevada I live in Colorado and I've you know watched the newspaper reports coming out of Nevada I mean I'm sorry Utah and um, it seemed to me that they're really minimizing this outbreak um, that's what oh you know I think you know I can't quote it but I don't know if it was a warden that they spoke with, a man, you know, with badges on, et cetera, and who was an authority. <laughs> Everybody's fine. Illness is minimal. You know, my son has said that there's people who are, you know, are getting, you know, some kind of apparatus over their faces, you know, to help them breathe. And so I, um, I'm quite offended, you know, by this minimization. Yes, thank you for sharing that. That would be a CPAP machine that they can do to get some positive pressure into their lungs. And that's very typical. I share your concern with the minimization. I, I don't believe that, um, you know, that they're all mild cases. And some of these, you know, may well be in the hospital if they didn't have some of that technology like CPAP machines. That would be mm -hmm. something that normally would be done in a hospital setting. Um, rather than, you know, in, in one of the dorms. Um, but, uh, but that's good information that we can forward on to the Department of Corrections about some of those concerns. And, and I do think that it's important for us to understand this is a, 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 an illness that can have varying degrees of severity. And especially in this um, community type setting where, where people aren't able to socially distance. They don't have access to hand sanitizers and some of the things that the CDC recommends. But, um, but thank you so much for sharing that, that uh, firsthand information. Any other comments or concerns? Yes, Carrie. Can you unmute? I did, I had to unmute. I had to get to that little button and hit that little knobby thing. So, um, so my husband's there. He's in A West. He was negative, now positive. So when this all broke out, they were locked down. And then I got to talk to him for like 10 minutes every few days. And then he became positive. He got moved from A East to A West. No cleaning of the cells. He told me the officers mopped the floors. That was it. That was all the cleaning. So whoever had the cell before him that was negative went to his cell where he was positive that was not clean, just a floor mopped trying to understand that. So now he's in a West where they're finally letting like eight guys out at a time, but their idea. Now I've been to prison. I did 15 months up there. I've successfully completed parole. I know how it works up there. I know how their mental, their, you know, like executive director Madden said, you know, his mental health he's offering to the inmates. What they've offered them, what my husband said, is they've come around and handed them crossword puzzles, a Sudoku puzzle, some crayons, and a pumpkin coloring picture said, here you go. Good job, executive director. I'm so proud of you. Like, you've done a phenomenal job up there. I'm furious with executive director Madden, the badge guy that was on the video. Like, I am furious. I've been up there. I know how it works. This is a joke. We talk about COVID. It's all over the news, how we need fresh air to get rid of it. The prison is recycled air. There is no fresh air running through that prison. They open that door, my husband says, for maybe an hour a day to let some fresh air cycle through it. So we have a whole section of positive male inmates with no clean air to blow this out, to help circulate through their system. How are we gonna get rid of it? Like, it's just sitting there. Like, it's just there. There's no one to clean the sections. The sections are filthy. He says the only time they clean it is when they come to get rid of garbage, just the trays. They don't clean it. No one's cleaning. Like, who does the cleaning? Our loved ones do the cleaning, but there's no one there to clean. Like, what is going on? I'm, I'm beyond frustrated. Like, I just want to flip out on this executive director. I just seriously want to freak out on him. He, gave, he sent that video how he's so proud, how he's managed to keep this out of the prison until now. He's, like, giving himself a well, I'm furious. I'm furious because yeah, it's, it's, I think it's that really that brought it in. I'm losing you, Wendy. You're yeah. cutting out. And, yeah. <laughs> I, Thank I you, Carrie, for sharing. Yeah. 
he's he, oh, heated on this. It's my husband Thank sitting up you. there. I'm taking notes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm taking notes so that we can make a list and 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 share that um, and uh, and share that with uh, Mr. Haddon and with with uh, the others who are in, involved in the direct care of these of these folks. And um, and I think that your concerns are legitimate. Um, I think that I think that the um, you know the leadership there. I do believe that they have good intentions. I think they're in a really tough situation. I do believe that we need to have, you know, increased staffing and all of those things. That becomes right. difficult when people are sleeping for their own lives as, you know, and right. so they're not, or they're, they're not going into work, but um, we share and I your appreciate frustrations. That. It's a crappy situation all around, but it is, they're the ones that are like positioned there to protect our loved ones. And they're not doing the job right and it sucks like my husband i just right. got the phone with him and i went for his call back to me and he's because he's getting his you know one hour out and there he is but he's yeah. telling me how it's all these yeah. young new inmates he's never seen or new officers he's never seen before and i'm like because babe i'm like they don't have them i'm like you have like 60 right. new cases of officers that are now sick right i'm like yeah. so it's, it's skyrocketing yeah. okay yeah. i talked to my husband so i gotta mute you okay thank you carrie all right, we've got a few more minutes. Um, any, any other concerns or comments? Hi, yes, this is Melinda Morgan. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I am an attorney for one of the inmates in A East in Wasatch. And there were uh, several guys who were scheduled to be released coming up in the next couple of weeks. And they're, they're, they were told that they couldn't be released until they've been 14 days with with negative tests, which makes sense. But what I understood from the attorney from the prison is that if after the 14 days, any of the guys in A East test positive, that that clock starts again. So then he has to wait another 14 days. So I feel like these guys are kind of sitting ducks, you know, who are eventually are gonna get it if they keep waiting there long enough. And they had release dates coming up that they could have enjoyed, but because of needing to be in isolation and quarantine for 14 days, which makes sense, I get it. But after they test negative for it, with it, you know, the first time and then 14 days later again, they ought to be released instead of you know, risking that somebody in their four tiers is gonna come up with a positive test and then have to restart the 14 days again. So it really concerns me that these guys are at risk or testing negative, that they're, the longer they stay there. And I, I echo the concern that um, Carrie was saying about the lack of ventilation. I don't think they have any air circulating through there. And I know these guys are doing all that they can to sanitize their trays and sanitize their, their cells. But I'm just concerned that they're sitting ducks if they're just going to have to start the clock over again every time somebody in A East, I mean, I think it holds 95 guys, every time somebody tests positive, they have to start the clock again. So what I'm wondering is if the prison would consider for those people who have a release date or who are set to be released to be put in a different area of the prison, like B North or someplace that has been, that hasn't been in use, where at least they'd be safe and not sitting ducks. I don't know if anybody else has that concern. Right. But it's a big concern of mine. Uh, well, and that's a really good suggestion. I think that um, that you're right. They are sitting ducks. You know, the, um, Wasatch holds. Let's see, on the 327 incarcerated in Wasatch A and B, and of those 327, we've had nearly all of them test positive for COVID. So. So those who aren't and who are waiting to be released certainly are, like you said, sitting ducks. So that, that's a really good suggestion to house them in another, you know, a, another unit um, and housing unit as they are in quarantine. Mm -hmm. Or even on the outside, can they, can they do quarantine after their release? Mm -hmm. To me, that makes sense too. Mm -hmm. Yes, me too. Um, Thank you for passing that on. I do want to make the comment that Angelo, he did get released after the coronavirus hit over in A West. So there is some releasing going on. 
even in those areas. But that was at the beginning of the outbreak, so I don't know if things have changed since then. My son's yeah. in my son's in Baker Block, and the cleaning is not going on, and he's not he wasn't getting his meds at all. Four four and five days in between letting him out. The, they were throwing all their styrofoam food containers down into the main walkway and it was piling up and they weren't cleaning it up. The cleaning's not going on. They're not, no, they're not, they're not letting them out. They're and not getting them And who said they, they were putting it in a hallway? My son. Okay, and no meds. And then the styrofoam, the styrofoam trays are just being piled up in the hallway. Is that what you said? They were. They may. I called and I did speak on the clear back on the 30th to Deputy Nichols, Deputy Ward Nichols. Also, uh -huh. he has not seen a caseworker. He's been in there six weeks now. There's no form to fill out to for medical for family, and no one's going and checking on him. He's at, he asked to see a doctor several times about his meds. Said they'd put them on a list. Oh dear. So that hasn't been resolved. Nope. Okay. Shoot. Keep. I know there's other. Not. I know. I know there's a lot of other people in there that are not getting meds that have more serious health issues, such as diabetes right. and hearts and st such as that. And nobody should be going without their meds. Wow. No, no, absolutely not. That's very dangerous. Yeah. All right. Thank you for passing that on. I'm adding that to the well, list. The, the time they get out of their cell, cells, I think, is, is extremely important because of the mentality that they're dealing with. Four right. or five days at a time. For luckily 20 minutes, if you're lucky. Right. Right. Any, anything else? We've got about five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe. Uh, this is Beth Thompson. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Okay. My, um, we were wondering about like autoimmune diseases that any of the inmates might have and can compromise their immune system if they were to catch the COVID. Um, what is being done about that? Um, I'm not aware that there's anything special being done except for with those who might be, um, um, you know, on hospice or, or already in the infirmary. Um, I do know, let me look here. Faye, do you, are you aware of anything? My son did test positive for COVID too, by the way. Okay. And he's, he's not aware of anybody that's being taken to medical that's asked to go to medical that has it. Right. Yeah. They're trying to, they're trying to keep that completely separate for those who are already in medical, um, who are, who are compromised either, you know, geriatric patients or, um, or those on yeah, hospice. Yeah, that, uh, yes. Those care. people need immediate attention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, yeah. I don't think there's anything being done necessarily for those, like you said, who have autoimmune diseases um, and are at more, more at risk. Really, they are keeping the folks who test positive in with their cohort of others who test positive or even those who just have been around those who have tested positive. There's not really great separation between those two cohorts. Those okay. who are presumed positive or have tested positive or haven't yet tested positive. Hold, hold on, Wendy. The Wasatch. Uh, yeah. Wendy, there's been, a, there's been a separation already taken care of prior. I don't know how strict that separation is. But those inmates who are deemed the most at risk were put in OCR 5 and have right. been kept okay. separate yeah. from the rest of the prison throughout this COVID period. Um, but I couldn't say what kind of restrictions when they've had to go to medical, you know, and they've needed extra right. medical assistance have come up. Right. But that's the best they've right. done is try to isolate them. And then some of the most sick that might have been closer to their parole date, they've already granted those early paroles or um, 
compassionate release. I know, I know a couple have got compassionate release, even though there's many that could probably qualify that haven't at the same time. So that's yeah, kind of the managing. You, those. Thank you, Faye, for, for interjecting that. Um, the, yeah, so I don't know how they stratified those who would go to Ochre 5. Sounds like your husband, Beth, you know, may, has not met that criteria. I would presume those with, you know, diabetes, type 1 or type 2 or heart disease, those kinds of things would have already transitioned to that more protective area. Um, there's, there's several, my husband's in promontory too, and they haven't been moved. There's several of them that are at high risk. Too, with them getting COVID, they could be severely, it's basically a death sentence if they have an autoimmune disease. So, you know, they're not even providing cleaning supplies for them. They have one bottle of a half of a bottle of watered down bleach for 50 guys. That's not going to yeah. clean anything. That's disgusting. And my, my husband's a clean freak. He wants to keep things clean, especially with the COVID situation. So, and then the other issue is them wanting to start working inmates at, C, uh, what is it, UCI again, starting Wednesday. What, what's going on with that? Guards are coming in all the time, in and out, um, going from all of them, you know what I mean? So what do we do? What can we do? Does anybody have any feedback, anybody from UPAN on that situation? Are you talking about them going back to work? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I had mentioned, you know, over in Promontory, it's a completely different area of the prison. Um, Wasatch is his own housing area, completely enclosed, and Promontory is not even, it's, it's distance. So I don't know how much crossing between housing units these guards are doing. So you would have to find out if they're keeping guards separate. Hold on, I'm talking. And I think what that what they're trying to do to keep folks in the other um, housing units safe, even with those guards and those uh, personnel who travel from from place to place, they are using their full uh, PPE equipment. So they look, you know, like the hazmat suits um, that they are using as they go into these infected units to keep themselves clean as well as to prevent the transmission to other inmates in other locations. So um, I think, you know, that's, that's what they've done to try to minimize that. Um, and it's not necessarily ideal, but it's good to get those folks back to working. It's going to help their own mental health. And, and you know, if, if we can do that safely, I think, you know, your, your concerns are definitely um, valid but I think that, that um, they are really uh, utilizing the PPE to try to prevent that spread. Um, and there's, I, I, I reviewed the CDC's um, recommendations and it looks like from what um, I heard, again, like many of you in the video that, that uh, Director Haddon put out, um, it looks like they're really trying to follow those guidelines um, uh, pretty well. There are some new ones that just came out this week um, that hopefully will be implemented as well and um, having to do with how you cohort the inmates, uh, keeping those who are positive away from those who are still negative but have been in contact. I don't know that that's happening yet, but hopefully that will be implemented. And again, you know, the CDC recommendation that they use the full PPE as they go from place to place so that they're not carrying any infection to other parts of the, of the uh, facility. So I hope that helps alleviate some concern, but certainly it, you know, it only takes one and we know that that's exactly how this outbreak started. Others. Yeah, I, have, I have a quick question. Whoops, I'm sorry. Can no? I go ahead? Yeah, I, yeah, um, go ahead. I have, just have, I have a, a question. Um, I, what I'm hearing from people, um, which sounds like a lot of personal information, is that these are inhumane conditions. And this is absolutely unacceptable. And my question is, um, 
you know, and maybe you don't have an answer and I don't know the answer either, but is it possible to contact the ACLU and um, bring an independent party in to um, look at the conditions? Um, again, these are inhumane conditions. Yeah, and now the ACLU has been uh, very active in advocating for those incarcerated and for appropriate COVID protections. Um, and But yes, we can certainly reach out to them. Um, can we do that have. as a, well, I think, can we do that as a group? I mean, AC, what if we all signed our names? You know, I- a, ACLU, course, ACL, I talked to an attorney from the ACLU the other night. They will be out at the protest tomorrow and they are aware of the conditions and their concerns are the same as all of ours and they will be bringing that up to them. Okay, is there anything we can do as a powerful group with numbers? Um, they you want, know, they really want inmates to call and I think that's really at a disadvantage for them because they're the ones that get retaliation. Yeah, well, my, every phone call is recorded. My son has already been targeted. You know, calling it, an attorney is illegal for them to do that, even though they still do it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is bad. So I think as family members and as those of us who are able to, from the UPAN perspective, um, you know, be active, uh, uh, support the ACLU, but also it's important to contact your own representatives and senators via an email or a phone call and um, and let them know you know what you're hearing and what the conditions are because there's power in our legislative body and they are meeting for interim session their um, next meetings I believe are next week possibly the next I, I, I don't have the calendar right in front of me but do you have um, any idea how we find out who we contact for who we're supposed to talk to what's that for our senators at a Oh, for your senators, look on le.utah.gov. I'm sorry, what is that? L-E, so L as in Larry. lilac, okay. Larry, E as in elephant, at utah.gov. And you'll okay. be able to search uh, based on your, um, your zip code. And you'll, you'll find your representative and your senator. And I think... Uh, and that's at the state level, uh, you know, so we want to contact our state representatives and our state, uh, so our state um, senators as well. And um, especially you can look, you can also look and see what committees they're on, if they're on the Health and Human Services Committee, or the Law Enforcement Committee, or the Judiciary, all those committees, you know, are discussing this, uh, this, this interim session, so, or this interim season. Thank you. October 19th is the next is the next meeting. So I'm not sure what the agenda is, but you can listen into that as well. But that's the website. Um, and, you know, we feel really powerless out here. But uh, uh, as the comment was, we are a strong body. And I think the most important thing we can do is try to develop relationships with folks who can make a difference. And those include, you know, our our um, representatives and our senators and um, get to know them but right now there are immediate needs um, and I do know that the uh, uh, that there are those um, uh, from the legal defense uh, Utah Legal Defense Association who are also advocating for the release of those who can um, who can be safely released so there's lots going on we know that this is not an ideal situation and it's it's really tough for all of us to see our, our loved ones suffering and, a, and, and in a situation that may not be as safe as, as we would like it to be. True. Okay, we've got time for one more comment or concern or question. I know there are some questions on the chat. I'm gonna look at that really quick, um, but, but go ahead and chime in if you. This um, is, my name is Sandy and I have a son in A West. And um, I concur with everything that everyone is saying. All those things are happening in A West, according to my son as well. Um, the one thing I do want to add is, if you could put this on your list, he he got tested like everybody else, but he didn't get a test result. And if he's got it, he absolutely is asymptomatic. He says he he feels like a sitting duck. He feels 
healthy. He feels fine. And everybody is, you know, coughing around him and everything and, you know, um, ill. And every time he has said something, it, the answer he gets back is a different version of, well, you're probably going to get it now anyway, because you're around all these guys. So we got to leave you here. Uh, so that's, that's extremely frustrating um, to hear that he can't even find out if he's positive. He's just... He, he's just um, being told, ah, you'll probably get it anyway. Oh, that is disconcerting. Yeah, yeah. So I he can't like find out his just... test result. Yeah, he t they're just not giving him a test result. And, you know, it, that's, that's tough. That's tough. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and by the way, the, the, um, I, I didn't see who mentioned the, the coloring pages. Yeah, that's really insulting. I heard that too. That's really insulting. Here's a coloring. Yeah, that's not, that's not mental health. <laughs> I know. Well, and then, and then my son, my son has a, a he, he has a fantastic sense of humor. He said, not only did they give me coloring pages, but all I got was a brown and a red crayon. I mean, what is this? You know, <laughs> it's like, I know they don't even give you good colors. I know. <laughs> yeah. But he did, he just sending them to me and he asked oh. me to put them on the fridge. I'm going to put them on the fridge. <laughs> Good for you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Great. That's Thank great. You. All right. One last comment if we have or concern. I had a quick question about that with the testing in A West, because I just got with my husband and he was wondering about that. He was saying that they're because they're all presumably positive and he is asymptomatic, but he's saying they were asking medical staff if they're gonna retest them and they're saying no, they're not retesting anybody. So how do they know if any of them are in the clear or if it's gone through or like, how do it, we know if they're negative? It, they're just it seems like, it seems yeah. like they're just going to leave them all in there, let yeah. them all get it and then assume everything's okay. Right. They're and he said there's out. like 50 to 80 year old guys in there yeah. that have it and that are getting mm -hmm. really sick, but their medical's not doing anything to help them. And he's like, babe, he's like, these guys right. need help. He's like, they're not doing good and medical's not doing anything for them. So he's like, bring that up to them. Tell these guys to get them help. <laughs> yeah, okay. that to hey, get them Carrie, help. Carrie, it sounds like you know you and I have pretty healthy people in there, and they're yeah, you know, and, and our guys are going to wait it out. But but that is also what my son has been very concerned about too. Is that there are some really thick guys in there, and yeah. and this waiting it out thing is is pretty rough. It is. Yeah, he says he feels great, but he's worried about everyone else. And yeah, my son too. Yep. You know, other than you know, he sent he called me last night, and he's like, you know, do you got life insurance on me? And I'm like, you are not dying in prison. You are coming home. Oh gosh, it's fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I as a not as nice. a nurse with a nursing background, and um, Faye can can attest to this. I get really frustrated when we try to minimize the situation and I assure you that I will be on the phone and on the email tomorrow sharing these concerns with the powers that be. In the meantime, please call your representatives, call your senators, and we're grateful that Fox News is here tonight so that they can hopefully share some of these concerns as well because I think the more that we hear um, you know, some of the concerns, and there are answers to these. There is a way for us to do this safely. I am empathetic to those who Protest are- to tomorrow. those. Yeah, well, I really, I, as grateful as I am for the ACLU and for, for the protest, I think we get more done one-on-one, -on -one, individually, with that phone, in a very professional and positive way, with suggestions, but concerns as well. I think that that's important. And then document it in um, that phone call and follow up with a thank you, you know, email or whatever if they, if they hear your concern. But um, keep pushing, keep pushing for what you know is right. And um, together we can hopefully make some really positive changes happen. Um, I'm, I, do, I do kind of agree with some of you who have said, are they just waiting for everybody to get it? I think that's been the plan. You know, if we can isolate it to this housing unit, everybody, yeah. then they're done. 
But unfortunately, there will be people who will end up in the hospital. Hopefully, there haven't been any deaths. We hope that there won't be. Um, you know, haven't helped us in that area. But um, but I appreciate your concerns and thank you for sharing. And I'll get those typed up and sent on tomorrow. Um, all now, right. I just know that I, I barely that, came on. What's that? I said, I know I just barely came on, but my husband was telling me that, like, there's just so many concerns with the food, the portions that they're even getting. They're not even getting any medical treatment lately. Um, it's been about, it takes up to almost seven weeks for them to even be able to see somebody in medical. So who else would we even for things be able outside to see? of COVID. That was, sorry. For things outside of COVID? No, for things inside of COVID and also just outside of COVID. Like, they're not even able to order any clothes to even keep them warm in there. Okay. Well, you, know, you know, you have to submit a kite, and that kite goes to medical, and it takes, like, good Right, seven. right. They're saying, that they're saying there's not even a kite to fill out. They'll put them on the list. Oh, hmm. that's nice. Okay. Oh. Wendy, bring this up real quick. A West, there's no emergency buttons in the cells. Like in the women's side in Tippinogus, there is, right? But on the men's side, there's not. They don't Four have tiers, them. no emergency buttons. So if there's a problem, they can't breathe, there's an issue, how are they going to ask a guard for help? Okay. I forgot to bring that up. No emergency okay. buttons. How are they going to get help if there's an emergency? Women's side, we got that all day. We can hit that button all day. We yell that, but we can hit right, that button. Right, right, and yeah. That concern. That's a little bit uh, to help them with their. Yeah, I. Um, this is a tough. You know, it's a tough time for sure, and I do hope that. Uh, that it can be contained to those Wasatch housing units and that it doesn't expand across the prison. Unfortunately, it's a very scary time for those who are housed there. And, um, and I, you know, I can, um, I share your frustration and I share your concern and we will strongly advocate and at the same time, join forces with ACLU if you feel compelled to go and protest. That's that's, um, you know, that you'll meet others who are frustrated as well. Um, and then please pick up the phone, um, pick up the email. You'll get all that contact information at le.utah.gov. And then thank you to Fox News for being here with us. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, and this is, this is not at all related to COVID. Um, please feel like you, you know, I hope you feel heard. And I hope that you know that you can reach out. Um, you know, by way of email or a message on Facebook or um, a letter, and so can your loved ones. And um, and we're praying for them all, and uh, and for you as well. Um, let's. I'm going to introduce uh, our next little speaker. Oh my goodness, her name is Carol, and I forgot your last name. So you can introduce yourself, and she is the mother of Angelo. So. Uh, she's going to share some of her experience in trying to find housing as he was uh, released. And we're so grateful that you were released, Angelo, before it sounds like things are, are getting even more locked down. So, Carol, are you still with us? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. So, we had a place all lined up for the last year that Angelo was going to go over to his grandma's house. She's got a mother-in-law apartment. And everything was fine. He was going to be, you know, it was an apartment, a different address and, and whatnot. And APMP came in and denied it. And so then we had, um, my house is a backup plan. And uh, the parole board said that it would be okay if he were to be around my child. And then APMP said, mm -mm, no, can't do that. So we were just shot. We had nowhere to go at that point. Um, and so I didn't know where to look. And so I just started texting one night, every single room for rent on KSL and nobody would rent to a felon. Um, 
And then I did find, um, Faye actually gave me a list of housing places, uh, people that will rent to felons, which is pretty awesome. Um, but I went and saw one of them. It was pretty disgusting. And it, it was... It would have been okay to just get out and get through what he needed to get through to be able to uh, get into, you know, back into my house or his grandma's house. But um, he had to rent it for a year, and it was it was not good. Um, and so it was really disappointing to see the places that were available, and they were not good places at all. Um, and uh, but you know he would have been fine because it was not prison, so he was he was fine with it. Luckily, um, this gal named Julie had just bought a home, and she is renting to uh, felons. So she rents rooms to felons. So she's got four places in her or four rooms in her place that she just bought, and it's actually a really nice place. They're in the middle of remodeling it, so it's kind of uh, torn apart right now. But it has a hot tub, it has a jetted tub, it has a fire pit in the backyard. It's it's a nice place. It'll be really nice when it's um, finished. But, um, and I can't even tell you, like, how grateful I am for her. Because um, the places I was looking at were just, they were gross. It was sad. And I'm just really disappointed because I feel like through this last week, it's been he's set up for failure and as much as i mean i'm a pretty driven person and so i'm not going to let him fail but the system is definitely not set up for him to succeed not at all and to go to places like that um it was just disappointing so how did you how did you find this julie the group actually she posted in the group oh okay okay yeah i saw that post and she did have yeah one room. oh good yep she still has one more room for uh available yeah um well thank you for sharing that carol i i'm so grateful that you found a place and i'm sure Romer or angelo is as well and um and it is really, you know, it is um, a, a, an area that makes it very difficult to even get released because you have to have housing, you know, secured yeah. in order to even be released. And so you might have a release date. And if, you know, APNP decides that that's not a suitable place for you to live, that can derail that whole plan. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and that brings us to our next speaker, and we'll have time to ask questions and let uh, Matt uh, answer those. Is Matt Pullman available with us now? Are you on, Matt? Hey, Wendy. Can I make a quick yeah. comment about sure. Carol's experience? Um, so I'm kind of bothered in the fact that the Board of Pardons and Parole gave him permission to be around her minor children. They did not see him as a threat to the minor children. But um, APMP has a one size fits all policy. And that's where the problems are coming up. So there are some people who have offenses against minors. Um, in that case, it was a much older minor. Um, but they're still treated all the same as if they really are a risk. And so that kind of puts more of a backlog on these limited suitable housing that all those people that have these, you know, offenses are, are fighting for. So I wish that can be addressed better through the Department of Corrections, that if the board is saying he's okay around minors, there should not be worry about him being in the home with his family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Carol, did they give you any sort of justification why they said no to the first place? Uh, especially um, with family? So for Angelo, he was 18 and she was 16. So because he was an adult and she was a minor, she's 16 years old. So he cannot, he's on a group A stipulation. So he can't be around any minors. Um, so over at his grandma's house, she has a mother-in-law apartment, whole separate entrance, separate address, separate utilities. Um, everything was separate, but 
his uncle lives there in the upstairs and um, he has a girlfriend with three children that come over. And because of that, they said he can't do it, even though, which I don't understand because if you're living in an apartment, you could go right next door and walk in their house if their door's not locked, you know? This was a completely separate entity. It has its own kitchen and bathroom, everything. It, it's separate. But they said no. Hey, this is this is Matt Holman. Um, if I could just chime in a little bit about APMP. Um, if you get, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So the problem is, is that adult probation and parole is a it's a government bureaucracy. So their basically policy is a CYA. They're just basically kind of motivated to cover their own ass. So unfortunately, when it comes to in instances like Angelo's, they're just looking at the big picture. So um, they're just looking at it, the crime that's on paper and what it would look like if something happened or if, something, if you were to go back or violate. Um, so unfortunately, they're not trained nor are they told to treat each case like a case by case basis and to you know, use common sense. Unfortunately, that's as much, I mean, at least in my personal opinion, a symptom of our government, government overall as, as much as it is for adult probation and parole. Um, unfortunately, you get stuck with whatever that person's opinion is. So if it's a guy who's a hard line about that kind of thing, he's going to say no. If it's a guy who sees it not being a big deal, then it's okay. And you're going to get a lot of inconsistency across choices about where guys can live or where they can't live. Yeah, and I get the whole covering your, your butt, but... Um... So that's why we just dealt with what we dealt with, but it was frustrating that the board said one thing and APMP said sure. something else. Yep. It's frustrating. No, unfortunately, there's a really big it. disconnect. There's a really big disconnect between the um, the Board of Pardons as well as the Department of Corrections, uh, you know, internal operations as well as adult probation and parole. Um, the parole board will often say one thing and then something else happens in actual execution. Um, not to say that the board's always right by any means, but uh, that happens somewhat regularly. Yeah, I'm just extremely grateful for um, Julie and these people that buy these homes and they rent to felons. Um, I mean, this is a great place where he's at. And it, I believe what is meant to me will be, and uh, it turned out to be a really good situation. But it's sad because luckily I had the money to do this, but I can't imagine what we would have done had I not had the money because we got to walk into it with $600 on a deposit plus $600 in rent. And then when he got out, luckily he had ID and stuff, but there's another friend of his that didn't have any ID. He's getting the runaround because he can't get a social security card because the social security administration is closed. And um, so he can't walk in there. He has to mail it in, but he needs his driver's license to get that. And you have to mail in your original documents to get it. And then you can't get your driver's license without a social security card. And you can't get your birth certificate without the IDs. So this guy is getting nowhere. And the prison quit issuing um, the IDs, that, the temporary IDs that they were getting for like six months, um, for the first six months when they get out. So Imagine you can't get your IDs, that means you can't get a job, which means that you can't pay your rent. Who can afford $600 on top of their already existing bills to pay for these guys until they can get up on their feet? It's like, it's just setting them up for failure. So right. it's it was kind of discouraging. Wendy, you're muted. All right, there I am. <laughs> um, I'm. It, it is hard. That transition is the hardest time there is, honestly. And it is the 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 place that, um, if we can improve anything, um, in that transition, we will decrease recidivism and we will help set folks up for, you know, for a life of continued growth and. So thank you so much, Carol, for sharing that experience. And I'd like to turn the time over now to you, Matt, 
Um, I don't know if you, sure. uh, yeah, um, if you want to introduce yourself, but as I explained at the beginning, um, you are a formerly incarcerated justice reform advocate who cares deeply about the transformative power of education and the issues facing people transitioning back into the world. So with that, take it away. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Uh, that was a great intro. Yes. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, I'm formerly incarcerated. Um, I was at Draper for 15 years. Um, I've been out about three and a half now. Um, so I have faced, uh, you know, a lot of the challenges that are common to a lot of people that have been incarcerated or not. Um, when I was released, I was lucky enough to have a friend that, um, you know, kind of hit the pavement, just trying to talk to people. Uh, it was a volunteer that was coming in um, as a volunteer from the church. Um, and he was just talking to everybody he knew that was that had been paroled or that knew anybody that had been paroled and, and just kind of tracked down an apartment. Um, just so everyone understands, the way the system is set up is if you can pro provide an address that you're lucky enough to get APMP and the board to, to approve, you can parole there. And if not, the catch-all is, um, is a halfway house. So the halfway houses are set up. Um, there's just a couple here in the state. Um, there's a limited number of beds. Um, if you were to read what they do, it looks all great on paper. Um, but as we know, uh, I think working in the system, things that look good on paper, in reality, they're a hotbed for drugs, people that are in and out. Um, there's not really a ton of support. Um, it's very restrictive. Um, and they're trying to balance that public safety versus empowerment um, issue that it, that it always comes up because you have a certain number of the population that, that doesn't care about transitioning and and doing right right there are people that are still interested in um, doing other things and so the unfortunately udc is often occupied with those types uh, as opposed to creating programs and uh, working with mentoring or other sponsorships to help other people so right now um I'm one of those people that if somebody was going to get out, they might reach out to me um, and I reach out basically uh, me and my friends, we all know where we've lived and who we've rented from. And we just reach out to those people to see if they have any openings. Um, so it's very informal. Um, the halfway houses can be really frustrating and they're really daunting. Um, so I didn't want to go to one. I had a, a good friend that was there for a few weeks. Um, so it's really short. Um, so it's, that's the primary concern. I think that if we were looking at, I mean, if you're just talking about basic Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? The, the number one thing is shelter. So if we could find a way to provide a network um, of, of housing available for people that are trying to reintegrate into society. Um, the other issue is, I'm not a legal expert on this, but there's a, a law in the books where um, how rental agents units are like, they're basically punished if they don't screen for felons, um, it's called the good neighbor law, I, I believe, uh, or something like that. Uh, if you guys, if you pen knows anything more about that, I've often felt like if we could put some political pressure at the state level to get that repealed, that our housing crisis for formerly incarcerated individuals would be a lot easier because I know there's a lot of people out there that, that would and that care, um, but you're, they're kind of incentivized not to. Um, anyway, I've got a few minutes if anyone has questions about kind of what it's like or that fight to, to, to find a place. Um, but really it comes down to networking. You can't really hit the classifieds. You have to, most places you have to pay to apply, right? You have to pay 50, 60, $75 to apply. Uh, so you're often better just asking up front if they will rent to felons or not. Um, the other thing is, is trying to find people that are not part of a organization. So the current place that I'm living in, the guy just, he owns the place and he's just renting it out. So I asked him and he said, yes. So uh, you really are better off finding people that are, it's just their, their own rental property, it's their own house, um, as opposed to looking at uh, larger apartment buildings and stuff like that. Hey Matthew, I've got a question. Sure. Do you work? Do you work with Fresh Start Ventures very much? Are you familiar with what they're doing to help transitional? housing as people come out of prison no i've not heard of them fresh start ventures right i think they're based in utah county but i haven't gone into enough detail with them but they're also 
um, either purchasing or finding people who will rent and help them manage bringing um, those who have felons and sharing houses. And I think they're trying to help, you know, the initial transition out of either jail or prison and it's a month to month um, as you're trying to find something more permanent. So we need to look okay. into that more. Cool. They also, yeah, I'll check them out. They also build tiny homes for prisoners. Uh, for yes, yeah, so that's what it looks like on their website. For people being released, yeah, I volunteer with them. Can you tell us more about what they're doing? Well, to the limited extent that I know, um, uh, what I can what I can tell you is that um, I volunteered on several of their projects. They get people to donate a portion of their yard, um, and they build a they get volunteers together. They build tiny homes um, in the people's yard, and the, they rent them out to felons. I think they said 80% of the rent goes towards down payment on a house, um, and they have it was either three or five years that you can stay in the house, you have to pay rent, but you get 80% of that rent back when you leave. And then at the end of that time, the tiny house reverts to ownership of the house, goes to the whoever owns the property that it's in, and they use it as a pool house or a guest house or whatever. Um, but so it's a, it's a temporary place to stay, to get on your feet and to build up a savings account towards uh, towards buying a house. They're trying to get people into felons into home ownership. That was a program that they started in prison on the female side, wasn't it? Like two years ago. I don't know. I haven't been working with them long enough to be able to answer those questions. Sorry. I remember them coming there and teaching us that. Yeah, they also have like a program to help people in their transition out of prison and the inmates run it pretty much from the inside out. Um, what I was gonna say, but yeah, I think that's a great idea because for those who have a record, the best alternative for them is to be able to buy their own home. Um, Cause they said that that avenue has not been blocked yet by laws. And, and home ownership is the, is a key to being successful in society. It, it really is. If you wanna, if, if you don't own a home, you're at a significant disadvantage to the rest of the population. Wendy, you're muted again. Um, so the Journey of Hope, isn't that the women's organization that also is focused on home ownership for uh, women who uh, come out of incarceration? Yeah, they're kind of paralleling it somewhat. I mean, they're trying to help women get on their feet through treatment, job security, and helping them find housing as well. Yeah. So there are different organizations working a little niche, trying to make a difference. Yeah. And I've just been looking to see about any good neighbor laws, uh, Matthew, that you that you uh, reference. I don't see any in Utah. I think it's just practice that Utah landlords and, and across the country actually, you know, do a background check. My husband and I are landlords. We have two little fourplexes. And I'm happy to report that I told him this month as we had one come available and somebody who had uh, actually uh, been incarcerated for many years um, in the prison system here in Utah, both he and his wife uh, are felons and uh, I said, we need to put our money where our mouth is. And so we did rent to them and we did do a background check, but he was upfront immediately. Uh, you know, both of them were as they made their application. And to us, that was really important that somebody was honest, that they were open, they were upfront and said, you're going to find stuff on your background check. And, and, um, and then we were, you know, we certainly made them sign the contract and we'll hold them accountable to that. And I think that anybody coming out of prison um, will, will find that they need to be accountable um, to those requirements that landlords uh, have. But I don't think there's any requirement that a landlord runs a background check. But I think that it, that even if they do, like we do, we run a background check for all of our 
um, prospective tenants, but it really made a difference to have them be honest and to be open and to say, here's what our particular situation is. Here's what my crimes were, he even shared. And, um, and we understand that you will hold us accountable. And, um, and he also had, you know, re references that we were able to check, but, um, um, and we hope that it'll be a successful venture for us because we'll rent in the future to those who have criminal backgrounds. But I think, um, I don't think there is a requirement that, that landlords have to do a background check. However, that is the practice. And so it just makes sense for people to be open and upfront like you've suggested. Hey, Wendy. Up in Salt Lake City and Ogden, that's where they're doing the Good Neighbor. Good okay. Landlord program. So it's for the that good landlord. Landlord. Okay. A lot, a lot of the prison inmates are being released too and finding that. Okay, so the Ogden and Salt Lake have local ordinances. Okay. Yeah, so it's a local ordinance implemented by the cities themselves. Right. Not okay. at the state level. Okay, so that's where legislation can get involved then for sure. But they're not telling people that they have that they can't rent to felons. They're just saying you have to do a background check. Is that right? I, apartment I used to live in, they would not allow felons. Okay. And I know that you know that becomes problematic on the housing programs and and um, things uh, for certain for certain crimes, or depending on how you know, how long ago that crime was. Well, I've heard up in the Ogden area, it was intentional because they have the halfway houses up there. So many leaving the halfway house was resettling in the Ogden area. And so as a way to discourage settling there, you know, is why they started implementing the Good Land Level Program to discourage housing opportunities. Maybe they would go somewhere else. So it is pretty much discriminating against those who have past criminal histories. Yeah. Yeah. It, typically, the landlords uh, pay a, a smaller business license fee to the city if they agree to do that. Is that a question? No, that's a statement. Oh, typically, okay. That they get a break. The landlords get a break and their, their local licensing fees if they will sign up for the Good Neighbor Program. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that does, I mean, you know, unfortunately these kinds of laws actually, uh, you know, decrease safety and increase homelessness and all of the things that, that increase recidivism because housing is one of those things that, that are important, you know, for uh, reintegration back into our communities. So that's unfortunate. Anything else, any other questions or comments related to housing or that transition into the community? Is Matt still on the phone? Still there? Maybe not. Matt, are you still there? No. Guess not. Guess we lost him. <laughs> All right. Well, are there any other topics that we need to discuss or anything that you're, uh, that you're concerned about that we can forward on? We've got just a few minutes left. Go ahead, here. Um, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm Audrey Rogers, and I'm uh, a coordinator with my husband, Ernie, uh, for the Christmas card uh, project. And uh, we are asking for volunteers. If any of you have not volunteered, um, I recognize a few of your names. Uh, you can email me and I can give you my email or I can have you email Ernie, which is, has a UPAN address. And that is um, Ernie dot Rogers. Rogers, where is it on this? Ernie dot Rogers at um, Utah Prisoner Advocate dot org. Yeah, Ernie dot Rogers at Utah Prisoner Advocate dot org. And um, usually people uh, volunteer to send about 10 
up to about 50 and some last year sent 100. But uh, whatever you feel like you can send, um, and I will send you about a few days after the 1st of November, um, inmate names and um, their numbers, their addresses, and yes. full instructions on uh, the mention, mailing rules. Mention they can't send cards purchased at the... Uh... Yeah. Uh, also, uh, if you read the newsletter, you can hear, you can um, see the article about our requesting for volunteers. Um, it specifically says in that newsletter article, and this is, has been since last year, that ordinary Christmas cards that um, people okay. buy at a store, greeting cards, are not acceptable by the prison system. And so uh, along with uh, the um, Christmas card project or holiday card project, we uh, also have the Christmas card um, contest for inmates. And for about four years now, maybe more, uh, we've been using their images that they have sent in to UPAN. These are the last two years are posted on the UPAN website. These can be copied and um, printed on white paper that's very thin. I'm just regular copy paper folded in half or in thirds according to what the image requires and then put in an envelope that is an, a non-security envelope. And that's how we start. And then um, the other instructions I will send you uh, with the email as well as the ones that I've just been telling you. So we hope that many of you will volunteer. So far we have about 2,500 inmate names and some of those, uh, many of them are indigent and they don't receive any communication from relatives or loved ones. So it's really important to them to receive a card at Christmas, at Christmas time. And then there are others that um, they may have contact with other family members, but nevertheless, we don't really know, but we send cards to them also. And it's kind of hard to get the, the names because we go through the Department of Corrections website and just use different little tricks to get them because you can't actually get there. Um, unless you know the person, you can't get their name. Well, we've got 2,500 names of inmates. We need a lot of volunteers. So far, yeah. so far I've had about um, 11 volunteers that are new, from, uh, not from last year. And uh, I will be emailing all my old volunteers and asking them if they would like to participate again for this year. I am so, a new member and I'll be contacting you to help out. I, Thank I you, Wendy. Uh, I actually sent in an email to Sean, I think it was, uh, Shane. Um, so I can, I do uh, web automation and I can help you with getting the uh, information off of websites if you need it. Uh, so you, you had mentioned before, I think at last month's meeting that you spend a lot of time looking up information, current information about the inmates on the website every month before you send them letters. Is that right? That's true. Okay. So I do automation for a living. I can automate that process for you if you want to reach out to me. Um, I might be able to save you a lot of time. Well, Hunter, that's a nice offer. Um, the offender search website deliberately tries to block any kind of automatic searches. Okay. Well, um, I just, on, on chat, I don't know how many of you are following chat, but there was one individual who said that her son is not receiving mail during COVID. Is that the, is that what the rest of you are hearing as well? Or it's quite delayed maybe? Yeah, I'd like to know if everybody else is experiencing that. Thank you. I'm the one who wrote that. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I've, I'm experiencing that as well. 
Okay. My husband said it's really delayed. Okay. Yeah, it's been about a week or two weeks that it's taken for my husband to get his mail. So okay. this makes it really important then, especially for this Christmas card project that we get those volunteers um, um, assigned, you know, uh, first part of November. And thank you so much, Audrey, for uh, explaining that program. I think it's a really nice program. Um, there are, you know, you can, you can find electronic cards um, that you can print off. So online, you can find cards, you can print them off. Are we able to print in color? Can color cards that we've printed on our own printer paper be sent or do they need to be black and white? No, they can be colors. As of last year, they, they accepted color. And also remember that we have a lot of images from the last two years and we will have more hopefully um, put up for 2020 of the Christmas card, uh, inmate Christmas card contest. And we, so far we have had just two artists send their, um, their images to us, okay. but uh, one of them sent two. And so we have so far three. <laughs> oh, um, look, there they are, the ones so, that are on the website. So if there you, you can contact your um, inmates in prison, your loved ones, ask them to uh, tell them to hurry up and send us an, an image so that we can be, it, it can be entered in our contest. Um, we will be accepting them late ones up until about November 22nd. Okay, thank you. And this has been a really successful program in the past. It's been really difficult, I'm sure, to get volunteers to send those cards where we haven't met because we used to sign up on a sheet that was passed around. And so Shane is taking notes. He's sending all of this information through the chat system. And I hope we can compile those and get those sent out um, to everybody through our newsletter system as well. But um, if you're still on um, on this Zoom meeting, please check the chat and you'll, you'll see um, all of those email addresses and some of the contact information um, that's available there. So. Thank you. Again, that is um, for the Christmas card program. You will be responsible um, if you volunteer to purchase the stamps. So keep that in mind, how much you can afford and how much time you want to spend on that. But the nice thing is, is that you get to just print off the cards and you don't have to go purchase cards as well. So you can print those off and um, send those. And that does really, you know, for some of these folks who don't have family supporting them, or even if they do, um, it really brightens their holiday. Um, I can't imagine anything harder than going through the holidays without being recognized um, or, or receiving word from, you know, from a loved one. Um, anything else? Because we're about ready to wrap up. The holiday card mm -hmm. mailing. Okay. Shane, I just um, want to say thank you so much for all your technical support and for keeping everybody in the loop and for um, all of your help with, um, with tonight's meeting um, and, and for giving me the opportunity to be able to help steer the discussion. And thank you to everybody who participated. Uh, we're, we're so happy to see the numbers increase this month over last month. And, um, and thank you for sharing your frustrations and your concerns. And I just urge you to continue to share those and continue to reach out. Um, again, uh, we'll uh, include it in chat is the uh, information, how to, how to find your representative and your, your uh, you. senator. And, um, and then, you know, join up with those other organizations who are also who are also advocating for prison reform and for criminal justice reform and for uh, better conditions uh, throughout this really troubling and, and difficult time that we find ourselves in and care about all of you. So thank you so much and you all have a wonderful evening. I would like to uh, thank you, Wendy, for being yes. such a thank good you. hostess today and <laughs> also for the others who participated and uh, especially Shane Severson for his um, really wizard work <laughs> in using yes. technology. Yes, thank you, thank you. And yes, thank you for um, 
you know, to Angelo and to, to Carol and to Matthew, uh, appreciate you and, and all the rest of you who provided comment. And it, it feels so good to be a part of an organization where we can come together and know that we're more than just our one, you know, it, it, there's, there's strength in numbers, but there's also internal strength that we gain from hearing your stories and knowing that we're not alone. So thank you for sharing. Nice to know you're not alone. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um, with that, we'll say goodbye and look for the emails and, and continue to be active on Facebook and, um, and share the newsletter. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.